Uh, Let's just uh, pray into our message today before we begin. Lord, we praise you, praise you, praise you, praise you. Uh, Words that are fitting for our time together, Lord. Uh, Pray that this message praises your name, uh, honours your name, honours your word. Pray that your Holy Spirit works within us uh, to uh, do a working in our minds and our hearts that we may be challenged, that we may find confirmation in things. Uh, but Lord, may it ultimately bring us more in line with your way and your spirit. Pray, Lord, that this message uh, just honours and glorifies our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in his precious name. Amen. Um, we are on the final part of Hebrews, uh, and this is Hebrews chapter 13, uh, part 12, but chapter 13. Uh, next week, for, the, for four weeks, we're actually doing a four-week sermon series leading up to Easter, uh, and that's called It's All About Jesus. Uh, so very simple uh, headline title for a sermon series, Guess What Easter's About? Jesus. Uh, it's always the same, every day. It's all about Jesus. And then whilst I'm away, well, I'll be away, me and Dawn will be away for three weeks, uh, so two, two weeks, three Sundays, uh, and... Daniel uh, will be looking to take up a sermon series which is called Light It Up. So you're going to learn about Jesus, as you would already know about him, but we're going to keep learning about him. And then the three weeks is then how do we apply that? How do we apply what we see in the example of Jesus? And then after that, we'll go back to studying whatever book uh, we are led to study next. Uh, We don't always do topical studies, but it, it generally fits. We've got an Easter time and uh, and I'm away, so we're gonna we're gonna go for a bit of a topic uh, sessions, and then we'll come back to going back to study verse by verse, uh, book by book. This one today, as I said, is Hebrews chapter thirteen, the final chapter of the book of Hebrews, and what it does, it offers instructions for Christians uh, for living, and it includes a farewell, both a prayer request and a benediction. Uh, chapter twelve, as we saw last week ended with an encouraging reminder about the nature of the new covenant. This passage begins with a series of statements applying Christian principles to daily life, then transitions into this sort of shorthand summary of the letter's major points. And so what he effectively does, he tries to cover loads of subjects that he's covered in all the other chapters, uh, or or at least the the letter at the end, and he tries to bring that together. You'll see at the end, it ends a bit weird, this this, this last chapter, quickly throws in some updates about Timothy and then we get a hint because we wasn't sure about who might have written this we get a hint that maybe hang on he's talking about Timothy who might this be then who wrote the letter I'll leave that to you to decide many people don't say that we're not sure who wrote it Uh, I think probably uh, this will give us a hint as to who did write it in my own personal opinion Uh, but it does follow this pattern a common in New Testament books, especially those written by Paul, there's your hint. Uh, the writer gives extensive evidence uh, in chapters 1 to 9 to support a central idea. Uh, this concept was the new covenant. That's what he's looking at in Jesus Christ. He is superior, as we learned, uh, to the old covenant, composed of these laws, of the old laws. Uh, chapters 10 to 12 applied this knowledge to the need for persecuted Christians to maintain their faith. So what we've learned is that he's writing to Jewish Christians, people that are then being encouraged or trying to be pressured into letting go of Jesus and going back to the old ways. Here in chapter 13, what we see is the writer offers a few specific encouragements for the reader, and then he signs off, as I said, with a a prayer and a benediction. So let's look at our first six verses here. Hebrews 13, 1 to 6. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Uh, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honoured by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. 
what can mere mortals do to me? Even in these first six verses, you're seeing a very a quick reminder. Remember, no matter what they do to you to try and get you, pressure you, pressure these Jewish Christians into leaving the Christian faith, whatever they do to them will not change their destination as long as they hold on to Jesus. Whatever is done in their mortal bodies will not change what happens or where they go ultimately uh, to join God in the kingdom. So the writer, he starts by uh, showing these concepts, uh, wants to give them these concepts of, of love, charity, sexual purity and contentment. And these are all ideas promoted heavily in other New Testament passages. The principles given here are grounded in the letters uh, prior themes that we saw, such as the, the constancy of Christ. The common theme of this group of instructions is most likely uh, actions or attitudes. So now what he's saying is, this is the attitude you must have. You've, you've learned everything. I'm telling you everything that you need to know. Now, because of that, this is how you behave. This is what it should do to you. This is the actions and attitudes you should have. In our first two verses, it says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So the first action, the first attitude he is trying to tell us about is that we must have is to keep loving brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters, to begin with, is not about non-believers, but of fellow believers. Always, you might know that, but it's a good reminder. Is we're not in the, in the realm of universalism. Uh, we believe that there are people who who have believed in Jesus, become brothers and sisters in Christ, and those are believers. And here he's specifically talking about those people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus gave us this similar understanding. Who are brothers and sisters in Christ? What does it mean to be a brother and sister? Matthew 12, verse 46 to 50 says, While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. If you are a Christian, then you are a brother or sister in Christ. We are the adopted children of the Father. John 13, verse 34 to 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Of course, the one another mentioned here is fellow believers. We're told that first and foremost, believers must believe and be believers. There's no halfway house, in other words. There's no way you can just believe there is a God somewhere. Specifically, to be a Christian, to believe, is to believe that Jesus Christ came, died on the cross, rose again, and that he is God. We don't operate in a sense of the universe is, our, is what happens to us. It is God, the Christian God, who is in Jesus Christ. Before doing anything else, brothers and sisters... In Christ, love God first and foremost. Through that attitude, we learn how to love other believers. Only then, as we learn to love each other as believers, as, as fellow believers in the church, can we correctly honour God when it comes to being hospitable towards others uh, and, and offering that hospitality. So, in a way, what we're seeing is in the church, we're practising hospitality. But then that's not limited to us in that sense. What we're going to see is that that love that we're practicing and support that we're doing is then we're showing that to the world. They will know by your fruit. They will know by how you behave. And so they will know that this place, these people, us, is a place that they can be welcomed, that they can come into, because we've been practicing hospitality amongst each other. Hospitality in the ancient world, 
often <clears throat> included putting up a guest overnight or even longer. And this is the hardest thing to do when, I think, experienced in a time of persecution. The Hebrews uh, wouldn't have known whether a guest would prove to be a spy or a fellow believer being pursued. It was a very tricky time for them to have to discern whether this person who was at their door was a fellow believer come from far away. And actually strangers, as we'll see, strangers meaning actually other believers that they don't know yet. Not necessarily people who are not believers. What the author seems to be indicating is that strangers were likely to mean other believers. They would have been on the road looking for shelter, for safety. And in this context, it was to encourage the principle of one church under Christ. To recognise other believers so that we may share with them and help them and support each other. So as we practice hospitality amongst each other through serving one another, so this would help us in the wider attitude towards strangers and then we look at non-believers. People we're yet to encourage. Or sorry, yet to encounter rather. And it's meant to help with this sense of continuity as strangers become friends, welcomed into the local church, but with a kingdom heart that welcome believers from everywhere. And so as people see a, a community of people, of believers, there's something different about them. Their fruit is not the same fruit that we get from non-believers. There's a welcoming spirit. There's wanting to welcome people into a family, not to make it exclusive, not to create little groups in the church, but to open it up so that people can come in and know what it is to be in a community of believers. Verse 3 of our reading says, Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. I think today, this verses and probably many others are used to maybe start prison ministries. We've seen a lot of that. There's actually one not far away from us, uh, I think in uh, Plumstead in Woolwich, uh, and there's a ministry that goes there to help in that high security prison. I believe there's one running there as well. Um, and those are great. Those are fantastic ministries to reach out to people who have done things where they, they've really hit rock bottom, where actually they're in a place where that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the lowest you can be. Where do you go from there? Prison ministries are fantastic in that sense. But again, we need to be careful. This was likely, as we look at these verses, in context, in reference to imprisoned believers those imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. You remember this, in verse in Hebrews 10, 32 to 35, what, and just, just to give you a note, what I'm teaching you here is how do, we, how do we see context in the Bible without taking bits of the Bible out and going, oh, that means I must do is mention prisons. It mentioned strangers. It mentioned hospitality. Context is what we're looking at. Context always is important. Hebrews 10, 32 to 35 says, remember those earlier days after you received the light, when you endured in great conflict, full of suffering. Sometimes you were public, publicly exposed to insult and persecution. Other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Just seen a visitor. Uh, little cat, it's gone. <laughs> cat just dropped by to sallow. Uh, verse 35, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. <clears throat> Context. What the author is talking about is other believers who have been imprisoned. Nothing wrong with the ministries that we do, but here is a specific point that we must uh, cling to here. That context in studying the Bible is incredibly important. And the reason why I'm making a point of that is because we're going to talk about leaders. We're going to move on to leaders. So this is an incredibly important point. So I would say that there's nothing wrong with sharing testimony in the context of prison ministry. Uh, for there is people there in need of the truth that they are under grace and able to come to Jesus and be accepted 
through repentance and faith. And so he, he moves on. You see, he throws in, starts throwing in these few verses, about three or four different things. Quick, I've got, got to tell you this before the end of my letter. I've got, got to remind you what I told you about. Verse 4, marriage should be honoured by all, and marriage bed should be kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. <clears throat> the Bible <clears throat> does not shy away from taboo subjects. So we don't shy away from them either. We take them as we read them. God highly honours marriage. And he instituted this in creation, Adam and Eve. Some people uh, in the early church consider celibacy to be holier than marriage. But then Paul strongly denounces this and says, it's no better. There is a, you can choose the single life as a follower of Jesus, or you can be married. In the earlier times, there was a, a, a consideration. They thought that celibacy was something more than getting married. It, but it, it's not. Paul uh, rightfully uh, comes and says that that's not uh, any more <laughs> than marriage. Sexual activity in a marriage is pure, but this activity outside marriage brings one under divine judgment. Adulterers here means those who sleep with someone they are not married to. This also has to do with those who follow other gods. So what this is, is a physical and spiritual adultery. At the root of this behaviour... And attitudes we have when it comes to believing in God, this is what's this is what's at the root. Let me let me say this, and this is why context again is important. There's no use turning Bible passages into moralistic ways to live when it comes to non-believers. The approach that sometimes we may take is that we want a better world and people to behave better. But when we lead with moralistic rules, what we're doing is we're setting a standard that you're not going to reach. That that person is never going to be able to do on their own without Jesus. So the first thing we need to do is tell them that Jesus can save you. That if you believe in him, Jesus saves you. If we lead with don't do this or don't do that... And they still wonder why people do not behave honourably towards God. It's because we've missed a fundamental component. For people to honour marriage, they must first believe that there is a God. They must first believe that there is a God who sent his son to die for them on the cross and offer grace and salvation. What's the point of giving moralistic rules to someone when they don't believe in God anyway? At best, they, will, they may change their mind and slightly alter their behaviour, but that behaviour, that change of slight little things, will not bring them to salvation. It won't make them suddenly be saved. Their behaviour will not bring them into heaven, except in Jesus as their saviour will. Believing in Jesus is to change our attitudes towards how we live. Then what comes out of that is this determination to live to be holy in the best way we can. So what it does, believing in Jesus changes the root of our hearts. It addresses the sinful problem in our hearts. And we say, Lord, I recognize I'm a mess. I'm a, I can be a terrible person. I have sinned against you. And in that moment of repentance and wanting to believe in Jesus, my life, I want to change. I don't want to be that person anymore. I want to change from this way to that way. So what follows is my behaviour starts to change. It's not rule-led, but I want to honour Jesus because he's offered grace and salvation. And the best thing I can do to honour him is to follow what he's told me to do. The same can be said for these verses as we move on. Five and six, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, 
never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? We must know the God that said this. Believe in the God that said it before we can even begin to change our attitudes. If you believe that God made you and that we were fearfully and wonderfully made, that is the starting point to changing our attitude and actions in how we live. 1 Timothy 6 verses 3 to 8. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies, quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. If there are people who do not believe, uh, love money and uh, pursue sexual relationships um, outside of marriage, don't be surprised when they do that. Don't be shocked by the unbeliever who goes and seeks these things of money and, and sexual relationships outside of marriage. That is the very essence of brokenness. But we stand there because we know that we needed that ourselves. We, we don't come in condemnation because we go, I was in that place. I thought those things beforehand. I thought I could just do what I like and it would be fine. If they reject Jesus, then they reject the way he commands us to live. If we reject Jesus, then we reject the way he commands us to live. In that rejection, surprise, surprise, and I say that sarcastically, people do what their desires drive them to do. It is no surprise that without accepting Jesus, desires will be the thing that leads people. Christians, we are still tempted by those desires. We're still tempted by the love of money, by sexual sin. But now we have the truth. Now we know the state we're in and what we needed and need to solve that problem. So then it goes on. 13 verse 7 to 17. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Ooh. Wow. I read that and I thought, oh, let's take a look in the mirror. Come on, what's going on? What's going on in my life? What am I doing? That's a big responsibility, right? Big responsibility. It just keeps reminding you again and again. Verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings it is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore for here we do not have an enduring city but we are looking for the city that is to come through jesus therefore let us continually offer to god a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that openly profess his name and do not forget to do good and to share with others for with such sacrifices god is pleased have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. I didn't purposefully end on that verse, by the way, uh, for this section. It just happens to be that that's the bit we need to stop at so I can explain it a bit more. Um, the next two major points, as we've, we've seen here, uh, here are the need to respect one's spiritual leaders and the importance of 
faithfully maintaining sound doctrine. I say this now, uh, your amazing support, and I thank you for the support. Uh, I, I'm, I, I will say you're not a burden. Isn't that great? You're not a burden. Uh, you're fantastic to, uh, that you support me. I'm, I'm very blessed to have people that support me in this church. Uh, but it goes two ways, right? So we support one another, just as we are Christians, irrespective of whether I'm a leader or not. Uh, as Christians, we practice a fellowship and support one another. Uh, but you are a joy. And I, I hear of other ministers and their struggles and their pains. Uh, and we pray about that. Um, but we're slowly building a, a community of Christians that is very carefully about support and edifying the church. That our focus is on building a Jesus-focused church. So here... What does he do? Just as the heroes of the faith were mentioned in chapter 11, this passage refers to more recent leaders as those to be emulated in our walk with Christ. And also that this writer, he makes a strong point about the the constancy of the gospel. Jesus Christ, he says, does not change, and neither does the truth. Christians, therefore, ought to be careful not to follow novel or strange or changing doctrines. We're told to recognise and follow godly leadership in the body of Christ. Let me say this, it is incredibly difficult to discern leaders who are absolutely trying to stick with the word. There are many people who speak of things that are not in the word. There are many churches and it's really unfortunate and it's sad that the Bible is not treated as the main thing we study on a Sunday. Uh, I read somewhere, someone posted, one of the ministers that I know uh, posted something on Facebook and he spoke about, it was a brief comment and he said, uh, yeah, Uh, and he said um, that the thief on the cross when he was next to Jesus, you know, to come to Jesus and for him to be saved, there there was no coffees, there was no light shows, there was no entertainment. He just said, I want, to, I want to go where you're going, Jesus. I believe in you. And that was it. He, Jesus promised that he'd be saved, that he would be with him. Sometimes it's simple doctrine that we need to keep our eyes on. Paul advised Timothy here along the same lines. 1 Timothy 4.16 Watch your life and doctrine closely. Don't be afraid of that word doctrine. It's, it's not about being clever and smart and whatever. It's about how you, how you believe the Bible, how you, how you receive the Bible when you read it. The doctrine of the word. Watch it. Watch that you're close to it. Watch that you're sticking to it. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. That's, that's definitely a message to leaders uh, as he, Paul teaches Timothy. What you do and, and what you preach, if you stick to the word, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. So many warnings for leaders to stick closely to the word. So just as much as the church needs godly leaders, it also needs godly followers. The job of a pastor is to teach his or her people how to live after they are saved. That is the job of a pastor. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 14 to 17, I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I've sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Consistency is what Paul is saying. Consistency. But Paul is not saying, let me be clear, worship me. I'm amazing. Come and follow what I do. Do what I do because I'm the best. And in a frightening way, I'm seeing that today, unfortunately, that people want it to, to be 
almost a celebrity teacher, celebrity pastors and follow me because I'm the cool pastor. I'm the guy you need to be with. I'm the guy you need to know. Paul's not saying that. He's saying, follow my example. But who is Paul saying is, is his example? Who sets his example and how can he stand on such high authority? 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's where he began. I'm following Jesus, you can follow me. His authority is found in Jesus. If a leader is not following Jesus, not preaching the gospel as written, and remaining aligned to the fundamentals, the fundamental doctrines of the faith, then a leader has no right to claim such a position of authority or live out the claim that their example is Christ. How do you know that? How do you spot that? Listen to what is being preached. Test it against the word that's always true. Because the living word in Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. If the leader goes away from that unchanged gospel, then that leader can no longer be followed. In some ways it can be difficult to discern uh, a leader who is rightly trying to stick with the word and, and doctrinally be true. But this is why I encourage you to not, read, not only read the Bible, but study the Bible. Study the word and you will know. So do not be carried away with all kinds of strange teaching. Just stick to the one you can read. Stick, the, stick to the one you can study and know the word of God. The Bible is the test of a good leader. Not my opinion or your opinion, the Bible. So then the author goes on to show this parallel between these disposable, uh, dis the disposable of sacrificed animals and the crucifixion of Christ. He, he compares the two. Animals offered to consecrate Aaron's priesthood were burnt, out, burnt outside of the borders of Israel's camp, Exodus 29, 13 to 14, then take all the fat on the internal organs, a long lobe of the liver, both kidneys with the fat on them, and burn them on the altar. But burn the bull's flesh and its hide and its intestines outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Jesus, whose sacrificial death reconciled us to God, was executed outside the borders of the city of Jerusalem. John 19, 17 to 20, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Gol Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had, noticed, uh, had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, and for, this, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. In making this comparison, the writer is encouraging the reader to hold fast in the face of persecution, choosing to be identified with Christ rather than the world. John 15, verse 19. If you belong to this world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Now, all those verses about not being of this world should start to make more sense. Right down to the very act on the cross that Jesus did. He did them always with reference to being an outsider. Jesus was not of the place he was crucified. But for the people in that place, he was crucified. Jesus being from the other place, from heaven, from his father, and the place to come meant that he was able to offer a rescue from the place he was not. Let me say this in other words. He is the only one who can offer rescue because he doesn't come from this place. Anyone else is, is as perfect as they claim to be can still not offer the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ because he is not of this world, he is of the kingdom. No other person 
No other being or so-called other deity can give us a way out through redemption into the place above except through Jesus Christ. For that reason and for that reason which is sufficient, offer a sacrifice, he says, of praise to our Lord. He continues, 18 to 20, on pray for us, we are sure we have a clear conscience and desire to live honourably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. In this, this grammar of ancient Greek language, pray is, is this present tense. It looks for continuous activity. It never stops. It never ceases. It implies that they had already been praying for him. And we see that there were obstacles preventing the writer from being reunited with his readers. He knew that prayer could remove those obstacles. As far as the writer to Hebrews is concerned, their prayers will determine if and when he is reunited with them. This shows how seriously he regarded their prayers for him and then he moves into this blessing this is the blessing in the style of the priestly blessing that we do at the end of each service the one that we say uh, every every sunday in this blessing god is first recognized in his attributes peace power loving care and the ever giving love the eternal covenant found in jesus christ the eternal covenant has been taken to express the covenant that existed before the foundation of the world. The promise of Jesus was there from the beginning. And so he goes on. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. It's like a command. It's like I tell you this is what you need to do as I leave you. For in fact, I've written to you quite briefly. 13 chapters. Yeah. It's sort of brief, right? But uh, this last part is certainly brief. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. Here's a hint, isn't there? Hang on, he's talking about Timothy. Why is he talking about Timothy? Who talks about Timothy a lot? Paul talks about Timothy a lot, just to give it away. Uh, I want you to know that our brother Timothy, these are like the notices at the end uh, of a, maybe of a church service, sometimes notices at the end of a service. He's quickly putting in all these other things. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Great, uh, greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all, he finishes. The writer reminds us of his purpose. His desire was to write a word of exaltation that would encourage the discouraged Christians, both then and now. And this is a fitting end for a book that documents the passing of the old covenant and in institutes and reminds them of the new covenant. And so as the author concludes his message, uh, so do I. Those of us who have our salvation assured to us know this peace in Jesus. We know the power in Jesus and we know the love of God found in Jesus. Jesus is the resurrection. The shed blood of Jesus is the price of our peace. So we can have confidence in our salvation. We're not perfect in ourself, but we've been made perfect in Jesus. He is perfecting us as the Holy Spirit works in us to be more like him as we prepare for the day that we will meet him. The glory, honour and praise should all go to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of the faith and to that we say, Amen. Let's pray, uh, and then we'll worship. <clears throat> we'll have a communion time, and then we'll, we'll finish on uh, one more uh, worship song.